Thank you very much for choosing GH on TV. My name is Kweku Timi. Let's move straight to Parliament, where my colleague Ibrahim Al Hassan is standing by to bring you some interviews that he's currently conducting in Parliament. Ibrahim, over to you. You cannot continue appointing more ministers when you've plunged us into the worst economic crisis in living memory. For the first time, Ghana is going through a domestic debt exchange program. It's never happened in our history. <laughs> Financial haircuts. Nomenclature that we have never known. Suddenly, we are forced to get used to them. And then you want us to come and approve more ministers. And you heard the president send communication to the House today appointing a new deputy minister. So the president is not listening. So I am really appalled that this is what we came to do. The whole recall, getting us to travel, leave our constituencies, abandon first-time voters who we are assisting to register, to come and be party to the, the president's continuous insensitivity, gross disregard for the concerns of the Ghanaian. I mean, I am totally disgusted, and I cannot wait for December 7 for this MPP cabal to be kicked out. Because, look, they do not have this country at heart. And this cannot be leadership. This cannot be service. This is really a great disservice that this president continues to do to our country. Yeah. Finally, on the Chamber Happiness, and you're still live on, uh, of course, News Tonight on GH1 TV. We're engaging a more parliament uh, for North Tong Samuel Okujo to Ablakwa. Uh, the government, uh, the finance minister, Alexander Kwamina Afinumak, and the majority leader, all the others argue that the city is depreciating and it's doing so very fast. There's a need for some injection, and thus the $150 million facility. Uh, isn't that a tenable argument? That cannot be a tenable argument. Look, we have said time without number that we cannot keep going for loans as the panacea to anything. Loans only deepen your woes. Loans cannot salvage a situation. We know that what is at the heart of this depreciation is the structure of this economy. Seven good years, they told us they are doing one district, one factory. And yet, we cannot add value. We are still exporting raw materials. This is your scorecard. They have been exposed. So, it is not more loans. Look, if loans save a currency, the Ghanaian currency will, should have been the strongest currency in the world, not the worst currency as has been reported by Bloomberg. Because we've borrowed more than any country that comes to mind. I mean, even as we speak, we're under an IMF program aiming to receive $3 billion. That is not saving the currency. Before we rose, they asked us to approve about $200 million. We have approved loans to, the, I mean, to a point that not too long ago, our debt to GDP was more than 100%. And yet, the CD continues to depreciate. So it is not loans. I mean, these are just lame excuses. And if this is the mindset of those who claim to have the magic wand, Dr. Baumia, who said that the fundamentals, really, is the exchange rate, and that if the fundamentals are weak, the exchange rate will expose you. At a time, that it was less than four cities to a dollar. Here we are, hitting the 15 mark. I mean, who would have thought, who would have ever predicted that this would be our fate? So, 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 they should stop, they should stop talking about more loans. So, it's a matter of principle, and I've been consistent. You know, 16 years ago, I took the Honorable Jacob Echebi Lamte to court that it is wrong, it is unconscionable, it's unethical, it's clear abuse of office, and it is conflict of interest to purchase his official bungalow. And I argued that if ministers before him, 
were allowed to purchase their bungalows. There will have been none left for him to occupy as his duty post. It is that same principle. I am totally appalled that the Honorable Brad Champon, an MP Minister of State, will be allowed to participate when he was not eligible. If you look at Article 78 and 98 of the Constitution, he has not applied to hold an office of profit. The Speaker has not granted him per any permission to do so. I have checked, I have received a list from the clerk to the committee, all 47 MPs and ministers who applied. So he has no business, first of all, going near that transaction. But he's done it, he's been granted the hotels, and they are about to finalize the deal. What is shocking is the sheer disregard for due process. I have put out documents from the minority shareholders in Ridge Royal who have said that no shareholders meeting was convened. The shareholders agreement has been violently violated. I'm twisting. They didn't have a fair playing field. And that's what you get. When you have a minister with all that influence, a member of parliament, he's sitting in cabinet, he has insider information, and then he comes out to compete with others. How can you compete? How would there be a level playing field? And is it right that assets that are put under our care as public officials, we decide that we will just grab them, just take over them? I mean, which country would accept that? Which country will you see this where they really think about conflict of interest, protecting assets for the next generation, and even creating more assets, expanding the opportunities that should be available for those who are coming after us and those who, are, who, who have been put you know, in, 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 in our care. So I am clear in my mind that this whole transaction stings to the high heavens. If you come to consider the fact that even the valuation some of the documentation I have, the kind of sums, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. There was undervaluation? Undervalued, there is no value for money. I mean, it's just a giveaway. It's going for a song. And you also must ask, who is taking these decisions? Mm -hmm. At a time that the ILO is warning mm -hmm. that SNIT may collapse, they may not be able to pay workers' pensions in a few years to come. Then profitable hotels under your watch. You are giving them away. Labadi Beach Hotel paid dividends of 25 million cities only last year. The year before, they paid dividends of 10 million cities to government. Profitable hotels. Ridge Royal is doing very well. I have seen their financial performance report. They are doing very, very well. Why do you want to divest your majority shares? in these hotels that are doing well, to an individual in government, a government official. I mean, why do you want to do that? Where is conscience? Where is good governance? What happened to the president's pledge that any appointee who wants to do business and wants to make money, not in his government, they should stay in the private sector? We all heard the president say that. Now, the business and the money making is not in the private sector. It's right within government. Come into government and hijack the process, take over all the hotels. And you see, the other matter, which I'm surprised organized labor is quiet on, this transaction is going to lead to massive job losses. All of these workers working in these hotels, their jobs are not guaranteed. Jobs are on the line. Their jobs are on the line. You know, so... So, so we cannot continue this way. All right. This has to stop. All right. As Samuel Okuyota Blocker, a member of parliament for North Town, are giving us insight into his petition that he sent before strike. Uh, back to you, Kweku. Ibrahim Alassan, if you've not moved on, we'll just want you to run us through uh, exactly what transpired in parliament today for somebody who's just gotten home and would want to catch some update because we just ran into the interview with Honorable Okujetu Ablakwa. So just run us quickly through some of the events, even leading to the minority walking out of parliament. Well, so uh, this morning, of course, uh, before we went to the chamber, the conversation was about a petition by Martin Amidu to have uh, the uh, OSP, and for that matter, uh, Special Prosecutor uh, Kisiej Jabin removed. 
uh, the minority feel this is needless. Uh, Martin Amudu could have done better by just allowing the special prosecutor to work. Then we went to the chamber. When we went to the chamber, you know, this is an emergency recall. Three things were on the table. One uh, is the 150 million additional funding for Garrett, which was opposed by the minority uh, to the health. Uh, it had to come to a vote or head count. The minority lost because five members of the minority side did not come to parliament. So by 137, 132, uh, majority decision, that additional funding you heard Okujitua Blackwa talk about was approved. And then we moved to the ministerial and deputy ministerial nominees. 24 of them, uh, they've been working as government representative at the various ministries because the approval has been outstanding. Uh, the minority, once again, uh, through Roxy Nelson Dafiemeko, attempted uh, relaying to the decision that was sent to court, and I'm talking about the case that was sent to court, uh, to say that the House cannot approve these uh, nominees. After a little back and forth, the Speaker then cleared the way for that to happen. And then the minority, through its leader, uh, Dr. Kisela Tufosin, got up, amended uh, on his feet the recommendation of the appointment committee that the 24 be approved by consensus. It was amended to majority decision. Uh, his argument is a simple one. We are in an economic crisis. President Akufuado cannot be assisted to populate his government further. And after that, he indicated that the minority side was staging a walkout and that it cannot be part of the process. That resulted in a walkout. Uh, of course, as we speak, the 24 have been approved by a one-sided house. So when Ooh. the question was put, it was the eyes that had it, and there was no, there was no nay, uh, so to speak. There's one other issue that we are unsure as to whether it will be taken or not. That's the uh, waivers. Uh, waivers are uh, one of the issues to be tackled today. The minority had indicated that they were not ready uh, to take that today, which will have meant that the Finance Committee will have to go uh, sit down, prepare a report, the report will then be brought to the plenary, and then it's taken. The minority had already signaled that it won't be part of this, but certain has not concluded yet. And when Parliament sits on a very final day, as is happening today, because this is a day setting, anything is possible. Uh, Kweku. Ibrahim Balassan, thank you very much. We're grateful for your time, and we know you're bringing us more updates there. Well, the one-sided house has approved the uh, president's nominees, so we will be bringing you more details on that. Well, Member of Parliament for North Tong, Samuel Okujetua Blakwa, has petitioned the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, and I'm talking about Shira, to haunt the imminent sale of some snit hotels to minister for agriculture, Brian H. Champon Snit in February 2022 invited investors uh, with experience in hotel ownership and management to inject capital into its six hotels investments for a uh, controlling share of those hotels. But Honorable Okujatua Blackwa is accusing Snit of engaging in possible conflict of interest and violation of due process after documents in his process reveals three of the six hotels, including the Ridge Royal Hotel in Cape Coast, the Elmina Beach Resort, and the La Palm Royal Beach Resort, are on the verge of being sold to Rock City Hotel Limited, of which Minister of Agriculture Brian E. Champong is as a director and sole beneficial owner. Well, um, we will be get, I'm coming to my colleague at the research desk, Adam Kojo, who joins us for some more on this petition. Adam, Hello. Kojo, thank you very much for your time. So uh, what more have you picked on this particular um, um, issues cropping up? So Kweku, um, as, you, as we rightly all saw, the um, Honorable MP for Norton, Samuel Okujitua Blakwa, uh, who basically was uh, urging Shiraj to expedite his petition that has to do with uh, the, the diversification of some of uh, Snet Hotel to Honorable Brian A. Champon's Rock City Hotel. But generally, you want to understand what exactly this petition entails, and I would like to walk you through in the next few seconds. So first of all, it, uh, on 7th February 2022, um, Snet, that is the Social Security and National Invest Insurance Trust, published on its website a notice titled, Request for Expression of interest 
for investment in SNIT owned hotels in Ghana. So SNIT basically put out an offer um, a, a requesting for investment in their hotels. Now SNIT says that its objective of this is to develop the hotels into world-class standards in their respective categories and they are therefore seeking capital injection from competent strategic investors with expertise in owning and managing hotels and development of real estate to finance this project. Now, it also says that it was going to give preference to those who bid for multiple hotels. So this was what was in, on 7th February 2022. Now, fast forward today, Obkujito Ablakwa Honorable puts out a petition. But before that, I want us to look at the six hotels. First, there's Labadi Beach Hotel, which is a five-star leisure hotel with 164 rooms. There's the La Palm Royal Beach Hotel, four-star hotel with 152 rooms. There's the Elmina Beach Resort in Elmina, three-star hotel, 100 bed. Three-star hotel, which is 100 bed. Then the, the Ridge Royal Hotel, 79 bed, three-star hotel. The Buzia Beach Resort, three-star hotel, 62 beds. And there's the Strass Lodge Hotel, a 10-room hospital, hospitality block. Now, with the exception of Red Royal, where SNIT has 92.70% of, of the stake, SNIT actually has 100% in all the other hotels. So, all these big hotels are fully owned by SNIT. However, management are with uh, various different companies. So, this is what we have there. Now, in explaining the rationale, this is former Director General, uh, Dr. Oforit Nkrain, in an interview with uh, Daily Graphic in that same February 2022, who tried to explain to us what exactly SNIT hope to get out of this deal. First, he says its investors are to bring the facilities up to sta international standards and make them global competitive and derive maximum shareholder value. It says that some have misconstrued their action to be an attempt to sell our hotels to friends and cronies, but that is not the case at all. This is one situation that will come in very shortly. And then it says investors are being invited through a very transparent and open process to inject the required money into the hotels. So two key things there, no friends and family, and then it will be transparent. Now he also goes in to say that they will come and take over, but then we move forward, and this is what has happened. On March 27, 2024, SNIT rise to the board chairman of Red Royal Hotel. Now remember that SNIT has 93% and not 100% of a decision to divest 60% of their 97% stake in all their hotels within the investment portfolio. Now 60% of the Red Royal Hotel is to be sold to a preferred prospective buyer, Rock City Hotel Limited. Now what happened was that because they are minority shareholders, SNIT wrote to the board chairman requesting that the minority shareholders had up to 45 days to pay the valued sum of 10, of close to $10.5 million, after which, if they fail to do that, then the resort per their preferred prospective buyer would be given, or that stake would be given to Rock City Hotel. Now, the next one is that there's alleges that Rock City Hotel has made significant progress in acquiring Snit Steak in La Palm Royal Beach Hotel, Elmina Beach Resort, and then Ridge Royal Hotel. So now this is it, that apart from the Snits Hotel, apart from the Ridge Royal Hotel that we have in there, Rock City is actually making plans and it's far advanced. Clearly, what is happening is that apart from Ridge Royal, or apart from Rock City Hotel, going for a 60% stake in the Ridge Royal Hotel, it is equally getting 60% or trying to get about 60% stage in the La Palm Royal Beach Hotel and the Elmina Beach Resort. So this is what is happening in there. Now, what is Samuel Okujetua Black Blackwell's bone of contention in there? His whole point in all of this and why he is putting out this petition is that when he comes out, he says that the beneficial owner of the rich of the Rock City Hotel Limited happens to be the Minister for Agric, who happens to be a Minister of State, that is Dr. Brian Echampong. Now he goes on and makes some very, very interesting claims. He says that by virtue of Dr. Brian Echampong being a Minister of State, SNIT may have sidestepped some procurement breaches or may, might have sidestepped some procurement process to ensure that he gets it. He also says that there is an article in the Constitution, two articles, that require that before any MP is eligible to have any uh, profitable business outside Parliament, he ought to have approval from the Speaker of Parliament. Unfortunately, the Minister is not part of the 47 MPs that wrote to Parliament to get such an approval. So based on that, Samuel Kujetua Blackwa is writing to Shraj requesting four reliefs, that an investigation be made 
into SNETs to find out what exactly the processes were and if due process were followed. And also he's taking a declaration that because Brian Echampong did not or was not passed by parliament or did not seek approval from parliament to enter into or to be allowed to go into non-profit business, what this means is that he is ineligible to enter into that project and hence SNET ought not to have given him uh, such um, a deal. And so this is what the Honorable MP for Norton is basically saying that SNET should, as a matter of agency, halt this process because he doesn't believe that a fair process was gone through to give Honorable Brian a champions Rock City Hotel that deal, first of all. And then, secondly, and most importantly, he says that that is in contravention of the, the articles that be in that he, Brian a. Champong, did not have approval from the Speaker of Parliament to, at the end of the day, enter into such a business or even operate a business which is non, uh, not for profit, and then as a result, get this deal from SNET. So Kweku, this is basically a summary of the relief sought by Samuel Okujetua Blakwa, and all you need to know about the SNET and Rock City takeover, as widely speculated in the media. Very much. Well, you could also join us on our social media platform with your thoughts on it. Yes, did he seek that actual uh, permission from the speaker to be able to bid for something that gives him profit? Or um, some could say, is he not a son of the land? Should only foreign investors come in and invest in our hotels? Can't locals who are uh, able to do so do that? So, yes, we would want to hear your thoughts on this. But for now, we'll take a break. When we come back, we're bringing you more local stories to stay. All right, so we're grateful that you kept faith with us. If you're just coming through with us as news tonight, my name is Kwekwitem. We're still on some more local stories. And here, the co-chair of the Citizens Movement Against Corruption, Adam Senanu, has dismissed former Special Prosecutor Martin Amidu's petition for the impeachment of the current Special Prosecutor, Daskisi Ejaben, as a personal vendetta for speaking on Newsroom. Senanu argued that it would have been more appropriate for an independent party to call for a Jabain's removal and urge Amidu to publicly disclose any evidence he has against a Jabain to support his allegations. I assume he's attached evidence and that evidence needs to be made public for us to draw a firm conclusion on whether there's merit. However, I said it is uh, it's distasteful to have a situation where the former occupant is continuously, you see, if this was a one-off, uh, we probably would take it uh, in its stead. However, he has continuously raised issues with uh, Mr. Kizio of Japan not responding. Um, and typically, it would have been better if, for example, if he had firm ground, he found somebody else to take this up, rather than seemingly having the former occupant who left us high and dry without actually exercising his powers. Um, uh, being the one raising these issues. So they may be legitimate for all we know, uh, but somehow it, it does not sit well. Well, Dr. Justice Shumsai is a constitutional law lecturer and he joins us for a conversation on the subject. Well, thank you very much, Doc, for joining us tonight. Let me find out from you. So anti-corruption campaigner Adam Senanu believes this action from the former special prosecutor is born out of vendetta. Do you agree? Uh, thank you very much. Um, good evening to your viewers. Um, I, I do not, I find myself unable to agree with what um, Mr. Senano is, is, is saying. Um, and that, that is on the grounds that it is neither here nor there if he is doing it out of personal vendetta. It is neither here nor there. You see, we have a republic where a lot of people are afraid or have whatever reasons, to be quiet. And they, they, they are unwilling to talk. They are unwilling to point to wrongdoing. They are willing to lead campaigns against wrongdoing. And so this is not a context in which when someone is, is courageous enough to raise issues, uh, another person could say it is that of some personal vendetta. I think the point that needs to be made, does he have a legitimate point? Unfortunately, um, it is not correct also for anyone to suggest that uh, Mr. Amidu is supposed to 
puts the evidence he has publicly for everyone to to look at because the because process because that, that's the what movie. Adam Sananu has called for that look point out exactly the reasons why you think this man should be taken out of office he is fighting corruption he is inviting others give us reasons why he should be impeached and you think it's not right it is it is not right he, 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 there's no i mean his point is that the evidence must be made public mm -hmm. And I'm saying that that is not a correct proposition in, in the sense that the process for removing such an official is actually to be had in camera. And the petition, the content of it is not supposed to be disclosed to the general public. So in as much as it is fine and we, we should all be expecting to see the evidence and also the allegation and the content of the petition, uh, the law, the constitution doesn't allow that to happen the way Mr. Senanu is, uh, is wishing. Of course, his, his desire is legitimate and must be, I mean, we all want to know what it is. We all want to see the evidence, but unfortunately it is not the fault of Mr. Amidu that the evidence cannot be made public. It is what the constitution commands. And if you recall, uh, when uh, Fix the Country and uh, Oliver Vomawo petitioned against the removal of the electoral commissioner, uh, one of the objections that the electoral commissioner, you know, the electoral commission raised in respect of the petition was that the part of it, part of the petition was made public and that actually stalled the whole process. So it, it is not, uh, I'm afraid, it is not a very correct proposition to say that uh, unless it brings the evidence to the general public, uh, the process is tainted. And I think we should trust the process. Of course, it, it is a question of evidence mm. and uh, the, the constitution prescribes um, the, the people who are supposed to look at the evidence. So the president is supposed to receive the petition. He's supposed to forward it to the uh, chief justice, who is supposed to take a comment from the accused person, in this case, the special prosecutor, in respect of the allegations. Then when that is done, uh, then the, if there is a prima facie case, which the chief justice is supposed to determine, then the chief justice will set up a committee made up of seven people. Um, sorry, made up, yes, a committee to investigate or to, to, to have a formal uh, trial for, for, for the uh, 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 accused person. Let me use the accused person in this, in this case. And then that will bring to the end of the procedure when the committee finds out that the allegations are well-grounded and are well-proved. And all of these, are, everything that I've mentioned is supposed to happen in camera. And so we, we are not yet in a place where we can uh, legitimately ask for the evidence or the content mm. of the petition to be public. All right, so just a from side, let me hazard, I mean, uh, if you have to meet your students on Monday and give them uh, possible reasons of why uh, the citizen vigilante would go out and say, look, take this man out of office. I mean, you've been following the OSP, Kisia Jabe, for some time. What could be some of the pointers that you would bring out to your students and say, maybe based on these, um, that's why his head has been called for. Uh, unfortunately, um, I, I personally do not, uh, um, because of, I personally do not see some of the things that I can point out as grounds, but I can give you an idea of what what the grounds for uh, removing uh, such officials. I, I can give you an idea of some of the things that may be uh, part of the things to be considered. Uh, one of them is stated misbehavior. Um, when we say stated misbehavior, what we basically are saying is that people who are appointed to certain high offices are supposed to act in a particular way, uh, in accordance with some standard. Um, when they find themselves acting below such standards, they may be, I mean, they may be removed from office on that ground. That is one. Another ground is when uh, there's found to be incompetent. Like the, the person, the, the office holder is found to be incompetent. In other words, he's incapable of performing his task. Uh, and that may be seen from the way and manner in which he has performed previous tasks in, in relation to the office. So these are some of the grounds upon which the person may be, may be removed from office. Mm. Um, again, let's cast our mind back to an incident, I mean, the uh, Mrs. Charlotte Osei removal. One of the issues that came up and, and actually went to the court was whether matters of illegality or breach of some laws is enough ground to remove a person from office. And in that case, it was, 
I think the allegation was about procurement, you know, procure, procurement breaches. Some of us argued, even at the time, that um, procurement is not part of electoral commission's core function. Mm. And so to remove a person from office uh, for stated misbehavior, uh, breach of law, or incompetence, it must have something to do with the core functions of the office. Mm. Okay. The argument was rejected in a sense that it appears that now anything that any person does which is illegal or in breach of any law could be ground for removal from office. Um, so it, it could be anything. It, it could be anything uh, from from the performance of his office, the functions of his office, to even things that he may have done, which are not necessarily in direct connection with the core functions of the office of the mm. special prosecutor, mm. be a subject matter of, of this petition. But like I said, we need to hold our houses because that is what it is. We just have to wait and trust the process that... Uh, the outcome may be fair. Right. And of course, the special prosecutor is a very competent uh, person when it comes to law. He, he is well equipped to know what to do to defend himself. Right. Uh, he's well equipped to know how to go about this. So I think we okay. should just trust the process and, and, and wait. Justice from side, thank you very much for your thoughts this evening, sharing with us on news tonight. We'll straight away move on to other stories and hear the tensions between the National Democratic Congress, I'm talking about the NDC, and the new patriotic party, that's the NPP, boiled into violence today as a dispute over voter registration in a local community turned ugly. Well, the incident occurred at the Gasout Electoral Office Registration Center, where the supporters of both parties had gathered to participate in the ongoing voter registration exercise or the disagreement over the eligibility of a minor to register as a voter escalated into a physical confrontation with both sides trading blows and hurling insults. It is reported that the situation quickly spiraled out of control with party loyalists using sticks, stones, and other objects as weapons. Several people were injured in the process and vehicles were damaged in the ensuing melee. Before we go to our man on the ground, let's bring you some excerpts from the scene. All right, let's now speak to Ejekun Banahene, who is our man on the ground, to give us the latest on this development. Ejekun Banahene, thank you very much for your time tonight. So what more can you report on this video that we've seen? Okay, uh, thank you very much. The tension was between the National Democratic Congress, the NDC, and then the NPP, uh, and the new, uh, I mean the NPP, into violence today as a dispute over voter registration in the local community. In fact, it turned very ugly. The incident occurred at the Gasol Electoral Office Registration Center, where supporters of both parties had gathered to participate in the ongoing voter registration exercise. In fact, this disagreement over the eligibility of a minor to register as a voter escalated into a physical confrontation with both sides trading blows and hurling insults. And in fact, uh, quickly, it quickly spread out of control with uh, party loyalties using, say, stones and other objects as a weapon, and several were injured. So uh, the Kokobite Police Command uh, were deployed to the train to restore order, and the registration center was temporarily closed. Uh, so the incident has raised concern about the potential for further violence in the lead up to the uh, general uh, polls. Uh, so leaders from both parties have uh, condemned the violence and called for calm. But the incident has highlighted uh, the deep-seated tension between the NDC and the NPP. So as it stands now, both parties, you know, both one man from the NDC and one man from the NPP were picked up by the police. Uh, for further investigation. So this is what I can report for now, please. 
Just before you go, so what have residents been saying, the people in the community, those who are present, what have they been saying? Is there some sort of tension uh, amongst the uh, electorates in the community? In fact, uh, this video is uh, when the thing started, or when the tension started, uh, a leader from this party, you know, called uh, both parties to a calm, to you know, calm down so that they can be, you know, uh, a, a, a faithful uh, uh, register. But the issue with that, uh, people are sensing that even uh, voters registered, you know, are coming up with this kind of uh, high tension, then what of the national polls? Okay, so it has sound, it, it, it sounded like a big threat to the, you know, the upcoming or the incoming polls this solid year. So right now, uh, people are trying to, you know, consult the two parties, you know, to make sure that uh, uh, peace uh, will, will, will come to that area. Because, you know, the issue is that any time there is election in that community or that electoral area, there is tension over there. And so this is what we are sensing now uh, today, my brother. Bada Hene, thank you very much for your time. If you are in the Gasouth community, you can join us on our social media platform with your concerns, what really transpired, and share more details with us and it would ensure that the rest of the world hears about it. Well, still on politics, the new force has petitioned the Electoral Commission to expand the extend access to the ongoing voter registration exercise. What well, the movement expressed its profound concerns regarding the severe limitations placed on voter registration access for the upcoming 2024 elections. Well, in a statement released and signed by leader of the new force, Nana Kwame Bediako, the statement said the democratic principles and the rights of citizens is deeply troubled by the stark reduction in the number of voter registration points from over 33,000 in previous elections to a mere 1,068 centers, representing some 3% of the 2020 polling station total. Well, parts of the statement read, we are compelled to question the rationale behind these restrictive measures. The Electoral Commission of Ghana plays a pivotal role in ensuring the integrity and exclusivity of the electoral process, and it is essential that decisions regarding voter registration access are made transparently and with due consideration to the democratic rights of the people. Well, on behalf of the new force and the citizens of Ghana, we urge the Electoral Commission to reconsider its approach and take immediate steps to expand voter registration access. Well, their counterparts in other nations across many continents uphold the principles of democracy by providing open and accessible voter registration until just weeks before elections were they go ahead to mention that they implore the electoral commission to follow this example and prioritize the rights of Ghanaian citizens to participate in the electoral process freely and fairly in from the new force. If you're just coming through this, it's news tonight. My name is Kwe Kutsume. We're still uh, bringing you some more local stories. Well, we should be right back after this break. So we want to appreciate Bill's microcredit for supporting us to bring you business news in our very first story for tonight in business. The Ghana Revenue Authority, that's the GRA, has denied allegations that import duties are calculated in U.S. dollars. Well, the GRA in a statement released today, Friday, May 17, stated that the allegations of calculating duties in dollars as mis as misleading and should be disregarded. While well, the authority explains the costs, insurance, and freight value is converted into Ghana cities at the prevailing Bank of Ghana exchange rate, adding that rates of duty and other taxes are then calculated on the item in Ghana cities. It emphasized that duty and taxes are not quoted in foreign currency, but in CDs. Management of GRE stated that the customs division imposes duties and other taxes strictly in accordance with the provision of the Customs Act 2015, Act 891. All right, so we're ready to bring you some sports happenings this evening. 
All right, so in sport tonight, as the days go by, hoping to hear some great news from the Ghana Amateur Boxing Federation in their quest to give it their final shot in Bangkok, Thailand. The Black Bombers have finally been given the green light, according to head coach Ofori Asari. Well, the team have received their flight tickets to depart Ghana on Monday, May 20, and will receive their visas on arrival to chase their dream of qualifying for Paris 2024 Olympics. Monica Bukri, my colleague, caught up with the head coach of Faria Sari, and she's come through with this report. It has been quite a journey for the Black Bombers this season, testing the waters from Senegal to Italy, all in the bid to secure a ticket to the Olympic Games, which is the dream of every sportsman or woman. But all proved futile, as each boxer couldn't make hay while the sun shine in those tournaments. This qualification has been very, very tough because of how they've, they've um, organized it. Uh, Africa has only one chance at the African level to qualify and at the world level to competing with the whole world for a qualification is not an easy thing. But we are still coping and uh, we won some fights from the African level even to the uh, uh, world level. We've been winning some fights. So who knows? Uh, we'll go there and qualify one or two boxes. The Summer Olympics is a major international multi-sport event held once every four years. And as a country, boxing remains Ghana's most productive sport at the Olympic Games. The Ghana Amateur Boxing Federation confirmed the Black Bombers' participation in the final World Olympic Boxing Qualifier scheduled for Bangkok, Thailand from May 23 to June 3, 2024. Thus came after the team's unsuccessful bids at securing qualification for the Paris Olympics through the African qualifiers in Dakar, Senegal, and the first world qualifier in Italy. Currently, though passports of these boxers to represent the country have been handed over to the Federation, the team has yet to receive visas to Bangkok, Thailand for the qualifiers. According to him, they've been told their tickets have been secured. He, however, assured that five boxers from Ghana will be making the trip to Bangkok, Thailand, with two others from the United States of America and the United Kingdom. Uh, we have a boxer like Teoflos Aloti, uh, who has been consistent in our qualification. We also have Amadou Mohamed. Well, we wish the Black Bombers the very best on their journey to Bangkok, Thailand. Well, that's about it for the evening. We're grateful that you stayed with us throughout the bulletin on behalf of the entire production team, led by Musa Lansa. Tonight, we would want to say a big thank you to you and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>